This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 152. Hey, I'm Rachel Cruz, author of Love Your Life, Not Theirs, Seven Money Habits for Living the Life You Want. For more great life habits, keep listening to this. It's the Read to Lead podcast with my friend, Jeff Brown. I just remember growing up and uh, just making C's and D's on all my English papers. And I just eventually convinced myself that I was not a good writer. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. Hi there. And welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to your personal and professional growth. We talk about leadership of course, and also personal development, productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, and entrepreneurship. In just a moment, you and I are going to be joined by Chandler Bolt. He first appeared on the podcast way back in episode 70, almost two years ago. He's the author of the brand new book out now called Published, A Proven Path from Blank Page to Published Author. According to the New York Times, 81% of us say we've got a book or books inside of us. Only about 1% of that 81%, they'll actually ever get around to writing a book. If you'd like to put yourself in that 1%, then today's conversation is one you definitely want to stick around for. I plan to ask Chandler to walk us through his writing process. Writing a book can be a lot easier than you think. Tips on titling and subtitling your book, oh so important, of course. Chandler's four book launch strategies and much, much more. Just like me, Chandler is a guy who likes to stay fit, and that's why I'm recommending he check out the dress shirts at stateandliberty.com. They're committed to providing athletic dress shirts that actually fit. I first tried one several months ago, and it didn't fit so well because I wasn't in shape. It motivated me, though, to get in shape, and now I own several. In fact, my wife has to get on me about wearing something other than one of my State and Liberty dress shirts. Get 10% off your order right now with the discount code READ to LEAD, all one word, at stateandliberty.com. Three things to remember their shirts are designed for a V body type with an extremely tailored waist. If you are between two sizes, just size up. And all body types are different. Feel free to order two sizes if you're, if you're not quite sure. And then return the one that doesn't fit because all returns and exchanges are on them. They're my absolute favorite, and you can rest assured I'm going to be asking for more dress shirts from State and Liberty for Christmas. Stateandliberty.com. Use the discount code READ to LEAD for 10% off your order. Chandler Bull is the author of five best selling books, including the book he was here to talk about last time back in episode 70, that one called book launch. He's also the founder and CEO of Self Publishing School, the number one online resource for writing your first book. Through his books, training videos, and self-publishing school, Chandler has helped thousands of people on their journey to writing their first book. The new one out now that's sure to be a bestseller as well is called Published, a proven path from blank page to published author. Chandler, welcome back to the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks again for doing this. Really, really appreciate it. You didn't have to do it, but I appreciate <laughs> doing it and uh, just excited for this, man. I, mm. I know I told you last time and that I wasn't just blowing smoke. The last interview that we did, I, probably the best interviewer that I'd mm. ever done. Uh, oh, wow. And, you're just a legend, so I'm, I'm just excited <laughs> to be back. <laughs> well, thank you so much for saying that. Um, I have a sort of a tough question uh, to start off with, um, okay. and, and you've, you've, I'm sure, no doubt, read these same studies that I've read. We've all heard that that most people don't read at all, and I, I've heard percentages as high as eighty percent. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, haven't read a book in the last year, and so that to me begs the question, Chandler: Why a book and a business? helping people with getting their book out there if most of the world is never going to pick it up anyway? Right. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great question. I think really to answer that question, a book is, is the new business card. Mm. Uh, so a book is what gets you in the door to even talk to someone. So even if maybe they won't read it, uh, or maybe you know, there's another stat, Jeff, that says that of people who start a book, 
Uh, I think it's only 20% of people actually finish the book that they start, mm. <laughs> which is, which is another alarming <laughs> statistic. And, yeah. and, uh, and it's, it's kind of sad. I, I think it's just one of those things where it is such a credibility piece, such an authority piece, uh, that to even get the meeting or to even get the client to consider working with you or to even get that speaking gig or, it, you know, whatever that definite definition of success is for you, uh, it takes a book, uh, to be considered and to be taken seriously. Now, whether the end user reads that book or not, is really up to them. Uh, and I'm as depressed, uh, by the reading statistics <laughs> as you are, <laughs> Uh, but obviously, with the with the name of your podcast, you know how important it is. Mm. I know how important it is. Mm. I mean, I've already finished three books this month, uh, and I I just tear through books. and And for me, reading, starting to read, uh, was was the difference mm. between uh, my success path. I feel like I just know that I grow much faster because from the from the flip side, from the consumer's perspective, I mean, you have a chance to learn someone's to basically purchase a mentor. And their life's worth of work for less than 15 bucks, which when you put it that way, uh, seems like a no brainer. And I'm just surprised that people don't read more. Well, Chandler and I are, are connected online. And, and, and one of the, the things I enjoy seeing is his transparency when it comes to his goals. And one of those things often on that list each month is the books that he plans and intends mm-hmm. to read. And uh, gosh, uh, as somebody who reads fairly often myself, I, I think you're one of the few people who challenges me on how many books <laughs> you, you do read. Well, I got, I got back on the audiobook game and yeah. that's just been I mean getting back onto audiobooks has changed it for me and you're right I do my monthly goals every single month and the only one that stays every single month is read four books mm. so a book a week because I feel that's so important but I'm the type of person you might be similar Jeff where unless it's on my goal list it doesn't get a priority <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's like putting in a goal to spend time with your family or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm the kind of person that has to do that right. so if it's on my checklist or my my to-do list or my goal list, and it's actually going to happen. And reading is so important that it just always stays on there. Well, it, it probably goes without saying, but as alarming as those reading statistics are, uh, rest assured that the person who listens to this podcast is the exception uh, to, sure. that, to that rule for sure. Well, when I meet with a client for the first time, Chandler, I, I walk them through an exercise to help them articulate uh, their why. Uh, I was speaking at a, a Jeff Goins led conference a, a couple of months ago, and several of the speakers uh, harped on this. And, and you strongly suggest doing the same before you sit down to write. What does that process look like in the context of, of writing a book? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's two sides to that coin. There's the why you're writing the book, and then there's the what you want the end reader to get out of the book. Mm. And oftentimes when I when I ask people that question, What's your why behind your book or what's the purpose for this book? They instantly go to what will someone that's reading it get out of this book, mm. which although important is not the question I'm asking. That's very important. And that's that, you know, it's, it's important to get clear on that before you write the book. But when I'm asking that question, I'm asking, why do you want to write a book? What's the purpose behind it? What's the end goal? So for some people, maybe this is legacy. Uh, and maybe they know that they this is what they want to leave. The, they want to leave their mark and the book is a way to do that. For others, it's leads uh, for their business. For others, it's credibility or authority, uh, you know, that glorified business card. Um, for others, uh, it might be for speaking or coaching or, you know, landing, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's all kinds of different reasons that you would write a book. Um, maybe it's for networking purposes, you know, who knows, but getting clear on that, I think is really important because it structures everything on how you do the book. And I'll just give you an example for me, uh, for my most recent book published, the two main overarching goals with this book is I said, okay, number one, I want this to drive leads and publicity for self-publishing school. Mm. Uh, and number two, I want this to be in a, a create authority. So further establish me and self-publishing school as the go-to authority in this industry. Mm. So when people think of writing and publishing their first book, they shouldn't think of anyone else. Right now they do. I want this book to change that, right? So mm. Uh, through that lens is is how I choose my marketing opportunities because obviously when it comes to marketing uh, there's so many things there's so many shiny objects you know I like to call this the shotgun versus the <laughs> rifle approach uh, and most people when they go to market a book or when they go to market anything um, they take the shotgun approach which means uh, if you know anything about a shotgun you mm-hmm. know that when you, you shoot a shotgun it's a bunch of pellets that just spread out everywhere mm-hmm. uh, and it's pretty ineffective if you get further than than 10 to 20 yards out. 
Uh, and so that's what most people do. They say, oh man, Gary Vaynerchuk's telling me I should be on uh, Snapchat and so-and-so is telling me I should do Facebook ads and Chandler's telling me I should do a book and Russell Brunson's telling me I should do webinars and funnels and, and you know, I'm just so confused. And so <laughs> it's the whole jack of all trades, master of none. Mm. That's what I see people do and as opposed to the rifle approach, which is more the 80-20 uh, approach, which is that 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of your efforts. So if we're talking about the rifle approach, it first starts with getting clear on why you're doing the book. So let's, let's just kind of tie this all together for me for this book published. Uh, like I said, it's for leads for my business and then for authority. So the two main avenues that I'm exploring, I mean, I'm leaving a lot on the table mm. uh, and this book launch won't be as good as it could be because I'm more focused on the long tail. So we're, we're actually not expending all of our rounds during launch week mm. uh, because my focus is on those two things. So that we're building a free plus shipping book funnel um, which has already been built and we're already testing that. So that's one of the main things because that means that we can profitably acquire customers and continue to sell books um, for the long term. Uh, and then on the flip side, I'm doing a lot of podcast interviews, media, stuff like that, because not only does that drive leads, but it drives authority and it also drives backlinks and things like that for long term SEO for self-publishing schools. So the only reason I was able to hone in on that and really the only reason I was able to say no <laughs> To a lot of good marketing opportunities is because I first got clear on why I wanted to do the book. Mm. Well, uh, if you missed it, we first chatted with Chandler back in episode uh, 70 of the podcast. So I encourage you to check that out. A link is in the show notes. But uh, let's review some of what we discussed last time, Chandler, before moving into some new territory. Talk about the process of, of writing, specifically taking us from uh, mind mapping to outline to, to your writing challenge. Yes, yes. So uh, step one is to come up with your idea. Now, uh, the caveat I'll give here is, is this could be something that maybe you think you can write five pages about. Oftentimes <laughs> people tell me, hey, I couldn't write a full book, but let's just go with it. Even if you don't think you can write a full book about it. So you're going to get your idea. You're going to take a blank sheet of paper, preferably printer paper without lines. You're going to write your book idea in the center of the page. Then you're going to do a mind map or a brain dump. This is listing out every possible thing that you can think of on this topic. Mm. So we're talking every book that you've read, every lesson that you've learned, every story that you can remember, a conversation that you've had with a client on this topic. I mean, on and on. Anything you can think of. It's just going to keep branching out and out and out. And then what you're going to do is you'll, you'll form that mind map. You'll take 15, 30 minutes up to even an hour or more, depending on – some people just get rolling and they don't want to stop. So by all means, if that's you, keep going. Uh, and then you'll start to have some ideas. Uh, you don't filter anything at this point. Uh, then you'll start to see those ideas group into common themes mm. or sections. You'll, you'll group those sections into four to seven sections of ideas. Then you kind of organize those in the order that you would cover them in the book. Then you'll drill down into those sections and do two, three, four chapters per section. So this is actually going to form your chapter by chapter roadmap. So this is what will be the basis for your outline for your book. That's step number two is moving from mind map to outline. Then when you move from step two to step three, uh, you're going to move from your mind map to actually writing the book. And this is kind of a choose your own adventure. So there's two paths you can take here. You can repeat the mind map outline write process chapter by chapter. Basically what that means is you'll spend 10 minutes mind mapping everything you know about the chapter, mm. then spend 10 minutes turning that mind map into an outline, then spend 40 minutes going point by point from that outline writing the chapter. Now, this is exactly how my brother and I uh, wrote our first book uh, in one week is we just repeated that process over and over and over again, chapter by chapter. And then the other the other route that you can take when you get to step three, uh, if you're like me and you speak better than you write, mm. then you can speak the chapters. And basically, you'll still do the mind map and outline per chapter because that gives you some direction that gives you that keeps you from <laughs> turning on the recorder and then 30 minutes later, you don't know where you're at or how you got there. <laughs> uh, and then it's just a total wash, right? So this gives some direction and then you can speak out that chapter uh, and in a few minutes, then you get that transcribed. Uh, now you have something to massage, something to work with. Uh, and that, that helps kind of prevent staring at that blank page. So that's the three-step process. It's very focused. And, and, and through this, you've kind of busted this myth, haven't you, that, that fast writing equals poor writing, right? 
Yes, I was, it's something I often. Uh, this is the biggest objection I see people. Uh, you know, they they see me talking about, hey, go from blank page to best selling author in ninety days, and they think, oh, cool, you're 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 probably just uh, a proponent of crappy books and just getting <laughs> it out there, which is couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, that's why I even say the mind map outline uh, process before you speak. Because I know some 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 people teach the whole speaking process. They're like, oh yeah, just fire up the recording, talk for an hour and a half, get it transcribed, get a minor edit, and then publish it. Which is, I mean, that's not. I, I'm not a big fan of that. I think that if you perpetuate crap <laughs> uh, into the universe and, and and you know just put out content that's not good, then mm-hmm. you're not going to reap the rewards from that. So uh, on the same token, though. Uh, I'm a firm believer in Parkinson's law, which states that an object will swell in proportion to the amount of time or resources that you grant it. Mm. So meaning uh, anyone who's had a publishing deal, uh, they have that manuscript deadline. 90% of the progress happens in the month or two leading up to that deadline. Uh, So what I say is why not just shortcut that process and give yourself a force deadline uh, and get that book, at least the rough draft written in 30 days. Uh, and then you can kind of iterate off of the back end of that, because I actually think that, you know, the myth being writing fast equals a crappy book. I actually think on the flip side, writing fast equals a better book, mm. because instead of having split attention over the course of multiple years, you have full attention over the course of a couple of short months. And I think that that leads to just a much better focused, higher quality product. Mm. Well, talk about what you call, Chandler, the verbal read-through. This is the next step in the process. Not quite ready to send it to an editor yet. We're going to do a verbal read-through. And, and, and why that process is likely to be a discouraging process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I always talk about the, you know, there's the, there's the entrepreneurial roller coaster, right? Mm. And then there's also the creative process. So uh, this is not my original idea, uh, but I saw this somewhere and I thought it was pretty funny. So (laughs) it says there's six steps in the creative process. Step one, this is going to be awesome. Step two, this is hard. Step three, this is terrible. Step four, I'm terrible. (laughs) Step five, hey, not bad. Step six, that was awesome. (laughs) I love it. And I, I think every entrepreneur, every creative uh, can relate to that. And that's the, st- the, the, the step in the process that you get to when you first read your book is the I'm terrible part of the process. Because <laughs> right. you start to think, you're like, man, what planet was I on when I wrote this? And I can't believe that I actually thought this was good. Like what, what, what was going on there? The verbal read through basically what that is, is it's exactly what it sounds. It's reading the book out loud. And this is the first step towards editing. So we've covered that the most important checkpoint that you can reach is, is getting your rough draft finished. Mm. And I want to reiterate that until you finish your rough draft, nothing else matters. Mm. So don't talk about your title. Don't talk about your cover. Don't talk about how you're going to market the book. Really getting that rough draft is the most crucial Uh, important first checkpoint because once you get to that rough draft point then you actually you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel and you start to believe that it's possible that you could finish this book and and most people stop or trip and fall before they get there Mm. then you get to this point which is what i call the verbal read through which is reading the book out loud what's going to happen is it's going to start to point to the mistakes that you made or how you could word things better or places where it might be confusing because by reading it out loud you're kind of putting yourself in the in the read reader's shoes and you're reading what they would hear. So sometimes when you read it in your head, you fill in all the details and you know, you correct the mistakes and the words. So that's why I'm a big proponent of when you first get that rough draft done, doing the verbal read through because although it will be a painful process and although it is kind of a punch in the stomach, or at least it can be, uh, if you write anything like what I do, <laughs> uh, it can be a little bit painful, but that's the process uh, that makes it better. Uh, and it can be the first step before passing it off to your editor. Uh, this uh, same advice is one of the best pieces of advice I've ever received when it comes to uh, preparing for a public talk. Don't let uh, that time getting up on stage be the first time you've heard yourself deliver your talk out loud. Be sure mm-hmm. to do that before you get on stage. So so now it is time to pass the book off uh, to your editor. And this, Chandler says, is is where most writers quit the process. Chandler, why do you think that is? I think it's often just because they're discouraged in 
either they they're they've been traumatized in the past by an English teacher or by you know someone who just told them kind of kicked them while they were down and said hey you're not a good writer I know that's what happened to me mm. it, it it becomes part of your identity right. I just remember growing up and uh, just making C's and D's on all my English papers. And I just eventually convinced myself that I was not a good writer. Publishing a book is kind of a vulnerable thing to begin with. So I found that people, when they get here, when they start to get kicked into that cycle of self-doubt, they start to think not only do they doubt themselves – but they get worried about exposing them them to the world, right? Mm-hmm. Which is basically what happens when you publish a book is you you say, hey, it's like stepping out onto stage naked. You say, <laughs> hey, here I am in all my glory. And here's what I believe. Here's what you know. I think. Here's written word that I can't really take back mm-hmm. because it gets published. And I think that people get a little bit gun shy when it comes to that. And it's often the, the first time somebody else is – is seeing this thing that you've written. Yeah, which I, a lot of our students, they talk about that, where it's like, I'm, I'm scared to even show my editor my rough, rough draft, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I get it because I've been there. But, it, it, you know, it's just something you have to push through. Well, what about finding the person to, to take on that task? Is, is it a matter of just scouring some of the, the freelance websites? Is, is that the best place to start typically? That's the best place I think there is to start. Um, and, and so there's uh, sites like Upwork. That's one of the best ones. I mean, there, I used to could say, oh, there's Elance and Odesk and Upwork and mm. all these. But then they just slowly all bought each other. <laughs> so now there's just Upwork. Uh, mm. Or that, that's, there, that's one of the main sites. So that's where I go. Uh, a couple things that you're going to need to do here. Uh, you're going to need to list the word count. That's what they're going to quote you based on. Mm. Uh, quote it as a fixed job, not as hourly. Uh, you're going to want to give them the topic of the book. And I like to ask why they're interested in that topic. I will also in the proposal, I'll say, hey, uh, start your proposal with the words purple cow. Uh, You can put whatever phrase you want there. But that just shows me pretty quickly who read the proposal and who just blasting out canned responses. Because if that's their level of detail to my proposal, then that's probably kind of a glimpse into what their level of detail will be on my book. Uh, And then I recommend finding an editor that has a personal connection to your topic uh, and a reason why they want to edit your type of book. Uh, And then lastly, what I would say is be very clear on the timeline and outline that in the proposal so that they know when they're accepting that they accept your timeline, which just like the whole uh, writing process, I'm a firm believer in Parkinson's law here, editing will never be finished. You can edit into oblivion. So you have to really give that hard line in the sand. Uh, and it's important to communicate that to the editor before you get started. So not only can they hold you accountable to that date, which is important, but they can also know and be prepared to work on your timeline, which for me is, is somewhat aggressive. It's, it's an aggressive and fast pace. So I want to make sure that they're on the same page with that before we get started. Yeah, setting those expectations right out of the gate is so important. Well, now it's time for us to think about title and subtitle, what would you say, what advice would you give Chandler to somebody who's struggling to pen down the title of their book? Oh, there's so much here uh, because the title is important. At the same time, people, when they start to create their title, they go into what I call title land. Uh, (laughs) So they start to try to get way too clever, Mm. way too catchy. They start pulling out puns. They use words that they would never use. Uh, and then so the what results is this just confusing conglomerate of words that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so my first and, and biggest tip would be title a book like you would actually talk to someone. Mm. It's so important. You know, when people are trying to come up to a title, I say, OK, do this. Go to a friend, put on a recorder, explain what the book's about and then listen to that explanation. And your title's in there somewhere. Mm. So it's the it's your title lies in the words that you actually use to communicate the idea that is your book. OK, because right. when people try to go and there's so many examples of this, but they try to get too clever and they use puns. <laughs> my my litmus test for a subtitle or sorry, for a title and a subtitle is that if I don't instantly understand what your book's about within two and a half seconds of hearing your title, then it's not a good title. Mm. If, if I need the five minute backstory. Uh, and we're, oh, yeah, I had this life thing happen, and then this happened, and it <laughs> led to this story. And then if I need that, then uh, guess what? The people who are browsing at Amazon, they're not going to give you that time. Mm. 
uh, you know, you have a quick couple of seconds to capture their attention. And if they don't instantly understand what your book's about, then they're going to keep scrolling past. And, and the more specific you can get with your title, the better. So your title should always speak to benefits to the end reader. Hmm. So for example, a, t- a title that says, you know, live your dreams, follow your potential and have a passionate, epic life. That's so broad. That net is so wide that I don't understand what that book's about. Mm. Um, but, but if you go on the flip side, so Kelsey Humphrey is one of our students. Um, she was kind of working with something like that. Uh, and, and she's like, hey, how can I make this more specific? Uh, and so she worked it down, worked it down. And what she ended with was go solo, how to quit the job you hate and start a small business you love. Mm. Same topic, same content, but the positioning is so much more clear because now I instantly know, oh, I'm in a job I hate and I want to start a business. So this is a book for me. Mm. Uh, so, so that's really important. Speak to the benefits. Don't speak to the features. Uh, so speak to kind of the end result. What's the one thing that you want the person that's reading your book to get out of this book? Speak to that in the title and in the subtitle. Uh, and then lastly, as they say, it's easier to sell pain pills than it is to sell vitamins. And this goes into all positioning that you do with your marketing. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our students was working on a book about burnout. And the original topic that she had for the book uh, was how to avoid burnout. I said, hey, this is great. And it's kind of painful. Uh, but you're you're saying avoid burnout, which means I'm not burnout yet, which means I'm not in pain yet, mm. which means I'm not whipping out my credit card to pay you to buy this book. Wow. So I said, how about we do a slight reposition, which is what to do when you're burnt out, right? Yeah. So now all of a sudden, if I'm burnt out and work, I'm looking for something to solve that pain. I'm looking for those pain pills. So if we reposition the book slightly, which is not, you know, it's the same things, right? Yeah. The same things you would do to avoid <laughs> burnout are the same things that you need to do when you're burnt out. It's the same content, but just slightly repositioning it can, can lead to a huge increase in your sales. Mm, maybe it makes marketing the book a whole lot, a whole lot easier too. And speaking of which, um, we've talked a little bit about marketing. You mentioned the shotgun uh, versus rifle approach. How can, how can we leverage a launch team uh, to relieve some of the stress of, of getting attention for our book? I'm seeing a lot of, of especially new writers uh, leverage this technique. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, this is such a great, uh, great technique. And I always tell our students, like, if you do nothing else, create a launch team. So a launch team is basically a fancy word for a group of people that support your book. Mm. Okay, so there's what they get and what they're going to give. So what they get is they're going to get a free copy of the book. It can be digital copy or otherwise. They're going to get to see the behind the scenes of the the book. They'll get to be supportive and support something that's really fun. I mean, Mm. there's a lot of intangibles, uh, but... Uh, that's what they get. And people are scared to do this. Uh, but the reality is that a uh, New York Times study says that 81% of people want to write a book. But the sad fact is that less than 1% of people actually do. Right. So oftentimes when you say, hey, I'm doing this launch team, people will jump at the opportunity because they secretly want to write a book. This is as close as they can get to it. So they want to live vicariously through you. Mm. Okay, so people are really hung up on this. Why would people want to join my launch team? But trust me, they want to join. Mm. So that's the side on what they what they get. What they give uh, is they'll read the book ahead of time. They'll they'll leave a review when it comes out, and they'll help share uh, and and promote the book as they can. Mm. Okay, so uh, that's that's the way to do it. Uh, if you have twenty or more people, that's a solid size launch team. I like to manage it via Facebook group. The the important thing to know here is that is that quality is better than quantity. When it comes to your launch team, so just if you just say, hey, who wants to be on my launch team and you instantly add them and there's no hoops that they have to jump through, they'll probably be less committed. So what I like to do is is have an application. Then I choose the best people to be on the launch team. So that's what we did with this last book. And I think we chose about 100 just over a hundred people. We added them to the launch team and I do weekly assignments. So I'll do a weekly video as well as an assignment with that video. So I'll say, Hey, this week we're reaching out to bloggers and podcasters this week. You're reading the book, you know, this week the book's launching. So leave a review, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's kind of how we do it. And then one final bonus tip is if you do an application on the application, one of the questions is, uh, who are three podcasters, bloggers, or influencers that you know that you can reach out to about the book? Mm. Not only does this get them in the frame of mind of thinking that way, but when I give them the assignment of, hey, reach out to three people, they've already got that list. And whether they uh, decide to reach out to those people or not, I've got this huge list of people that I can reach out to and say, hey, so-and-so said that I should reach out to you about being on your blog or about being on your podcast. So you Mm -hmm. kind of crowdsource this huge list of influencers and people are are, uh, 
publicity channels that you can be in for your book. That's that's a great, great idea. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, share a bit about what you call uh, Chandler Amazon Juice and, and, and how we can leverage it along with uh, reviews and, and downloads on Amazon as well. Yes. So Amazon, uh, is, is, it's an ecosystem, right? There's over 100 million buyers mm-hmm. on Amazon. Now, I like to say that Google is a search engine of browsers. Amazon is a search engine of buyers. Mm. So people for decades have been focusing on how to maximize their SEO, search engine optimization on Google. Now, that's somewhat of a crowded uh, marketplace. While people are largely ignoring how to how to focus on their SEO on Amazon. Mm. Now, here's the thing: the barrier to entry is much higher on Amazon because you have to have a book right. uh, for that part of the Amazon store, right? So it's much easier to climb the rankings. And people come to Amazon for one reason and one reason only, and that's to buy things. Right. So that means they're in a buying frame of mind. So I want I want people when they're in that frame of mind. Uh, and then I want to pull them off of Amazon over into my site, into my marketing funnels, things like that. Mm. So Amazon's ecosystem, and when you talk about the term Amazon juice, uh, it's basically playing into the algorithm that ranks in that ecosystem. Now, mm. Jeff, you know this very well, uh, the the Apple iTunes store, right? Mm. With with podcasts and things like that. Mm-hmm. That's an ecosystem. Right. Udemy with courses, that's an ecosystem. Amazon with books, that's an ecosystem. And they actually all function pretty similarly. I mean, once you learn one ecosystem, you can kind of cross over into all those ecosystems. Mm. And all these ecosystems value reviews uh, above everything else. That's that's one of the most important things. Mm. Um, they also uh, value keywords and, and things like that um, for long-term search categories for long-term search. And when I talk about Amazon Juice, I really mean getting some reviews up front, getting some downloads and getting some early traction. And a lot of that can be stemmed from your launch team. Mm. Uh, So if you do that upfront work, uh, that can really help uh, to get some Amazon Juice from day one. And and that speaks into some of the specific launch strategies that you mentioned, uh, the free strategy, there's the 99 cent strategy. Can you expound on a couple of those? Yes. Yeah, so there's there's four main launch strategies that I teach. And th- this is kind of what I'm talking to a little bit in, in my new book, which I think is what you're referencing. Mm. And so there's the 99 cent strategy. There's the free launch strategy. There's the traditional launch strategy. And then there's the free plus shipping launch strategy. All of these are techniques and methods that, that you can use um, to publish your book. Uh, and really, the free strategy, that's been around for a long time, and that's what I recommend for a lot of people who are just starting to get that Amazon juice. And, and again, I'll go back to the beginning and just say that this, all of this depends on what your end purpose is for your book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you haven't mm-hmm. defined that, uh, then it's kind of hard to pick a strategy. But the free <laughs> strategy basically is that you put, it on, you put it for free for two to three days, then you switch over to 99 cents, then you raise the price. And this is when the, with the Kindle version of your book. Yeah. This helps drive a lot of downloads. This will help you drive to the top of the free charts. Then you transfer over to the paid charts. And that helps you get some of that Amazon juice. Mm. Um, so that's one way to do it. The 99 cent strategy, very similar, except you start at 99 cents and you do that for a temporary time. The traditional strategy, that's more of the, of the, the old school way. So you start at regular price and you know, we're talking about doing PR, doing book tours, mm. book signings, events, things like that. Uh, and then the the free plus shipping, you can have the book for free, just pay shipping and handling. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what we're doing with my book right now as well. Uh, and then what makes that make sense is hopefully you can just about break even on the shipping costs. I think we're just under break even on our shipping costs for our book. Mm-hmm. Once you factor in printing, shipping, handling all that stuff. And then it's customer acquisition, right? Right. So right. And, and people will pay a lot of money to acquire a customer, but you can almost get a customer for free through a free plus shipping book funnel. Then there's opportunities immediate, immediately and after the fact for upsells, for cross sales, for, you know, uh, to, for someone to go from, okay, I'm interested in your book to now let's do business together. Hmm. And I liked uh, one of your recommendations for you know, turning a reader into someone who can become uh, potentially a lifelong customer by giving away the audiobook in, in in the beginning of the book. Mm-hmm. This is one of my favorite favorite strategies, and people always seem to love when I cover this one. <laughs> so, to your point, Jeff, it's 
and, and this is in every book that I've done. So if you want to look at book launch, if you want to look at published, just go to Amazon on one of my books and you can see how I do this. So mm-hmm. on the first page, I'll say, hey, to say thank you for downloading this book, I want to give you the audiobook for free. People will often jump at the chance for this uh, because they know that price anchors, uh, price anchors them to the fact that normally they, they pay $10, $15 or more for an audiobook. I'm giving it to them for free. Hmm. Now, of course, all I want is their email address. Uh, so they get their the book in exchange for giving me their email address, which is a pretty great trade for them and for me. So now that starts the relationship off right. They say, wow, this guy just gave me an audiobook. Most people are offering me a free PDF or a 77 point checklist or, you know, mm-hmm. something that I don't want uh, in exchange for my email address. And so people, you know, that, that can oftentimes be discouraging for folks. So we've started the relationship off right uh, by giving them an audio book. Uh, and then, then that basically means that now they're in my marketing funnels and that sort of thing. And what, the, what I do is I put it in the first page because there's a look inside feature on Amazon. Mm. So people can look inside and preview the first 10% of the book. And so what that means is they can actually opt in or give me their email address and get the audio book without even purchasing my book, Mm. which most people would say, hey Chandler, isn't that cannibalizing sales? I would say no. I mean, of course, some people certainly will not uh, go on to buy the book, but if you see the power here, I mean, obviously an email address, a lead is worth way more to me than the three dollars and something cents that I would get if they bought my book. Mm. Uh, so, I, you know, by using that look inside feature, I'm able to just channel thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of leads off of Amazon through my books. Mm. I think the lesson here is that, that that releasing a book, publishing a book, writing a book, uh, so many opportunities and doors open as a result of, of taking this step. Well, uh, I want to ask one, maybe two questions not directly related to the book, and I know our time is short, uh, so I want to move quickly. Before I do that, though, is there anything else about the book you want to make sure we know? Oh, that, um, I think you've covered it. I mean, <laughs> you had a lot of great specific questions, and that's pretty obvious that you did your research. So hopefully that was helpful to people in terms of get, not only just getting started, getting it written, but also successfully marketing it. And before you think we've covered every inch of the book, I do want you to pick this up from Chandler uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, not the least of which is all the valuable templates inside that that I think you'll find very, very helpful. Well, it's been about uh, almost two years since we last uh, talked here on the show, Chandler. And I'd love to know, maybe during that specific span of time, uh, as this guy who reads about four books a month, what are, the, what are the one or two that stick out to you in the last couple of years as having a, a big impact on you? Whew, that <laughs> is a tough one. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is 80-20 Sales and Marketing mm. uh, by Perry Marshall. Okay. It's a really, really good book, really powerful book. Uh, that was kind of a paradigm-shifting book for me. And I'd say the second one is The One Thing mm. uh, by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Uh, those are the two books that are just really, I mean, and obviously it's hard to just list two, um, but those are two books that, have re- I mean, I've read The One Thing at least twice. I did that as a company book club for, for my company. We actually had Jay Papasan come in and do a Q&A with my team. They mm-hmm. love that. <laughs> so cool. Uh, and then I've read 80, 20 sales of marketing at least three, if not four times over the last, uh, since we talked last. So mm-hmm. Uh, it's, you know, those are two keystone books for me. Uh, in the last few days, I've been working on a, a blog post where I compile uh, the 12 most recommended books, the books that have been recommended more than any others by the 150 or so people I've, I've chatted with. Mm-hmm. And um, the one thing is on that list. Oh, uh, cool. Uh, and there's another book on that list that you recommended the first time. You were on. I think it was. I think it was four hour work week. Is also on that list. Cool. Yeah, that's a classic. Well, with the book coming out now, I know uh, you probably just want to breathe a sigh of relief and and, <laughs> and spend some time with family. Anything uh, as we look forward to uh, the coming year? Anything you and your team are working on that you're really excited about uh, getting underway, or are you just just going to? Uh, to coast for a while. <laughs> With Jeff, you, I think you know me enough to know that that's not in my vocabulary, but right. I, right. there's a lot I'm excited about. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're launching self-publishing school again um, mm. in the early part of 2017. This book kind of teased things up for that, mm. uh, but really it's just continuing to grow and impact people through the program. I mean, we've at this point, we've had thousands of people go through the program. 
uh, which is pretty exciting. And, and I've seen a lot of people's lives be impacted like my life was by writing and publishing a book. So I'm just excited to further extend that as well as kind of continue to put pressure on the publishers because our ultimate goal is to put the publishers out of business uh, and show people that self-publishing isn't just a option, it's the best option. So we want to continue to make that make more sense for people uh, and continue to progress in that way. So I'm really excited about that. Believe me when I say if you're looking for that extra edge, that thing to get you over the hump and actually to get your book written, this book from Chandler Bolt called Published Takes Away All Your Excuses. So read it only if you're serious about putting out that book soon. All the resources Chandler and I mentioned, including everything you need to know about self-publishing school, can be found at the show notes page for this episode. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash 152 for episode 152. And during this gift giving season, don't forget to check out stateandliberty.com and use the discount code READ to LEAD for 10% off fantastic looking men's dress shirts. Well, that's going to do it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read to Lead.